The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living hell will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. The last forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English spelling for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In part two of this episode, we will continue discussing the answer to two questions. Number one, what is the biblical perspective on hate and or judgment? And two, do or should Christians hate judgment? sometimes lodged as an out-of-context axiom, quote, judge not that you be not judged, unquote. By reminder, we are in the process of discussing several critical considerations regarding the issues surrounding hate and judgment. In the previous episode, we talked about the first two issues, which were A, source authority, and B, term definitions. In this episode, we will resume the discussion with the remaining three issues, C. The existence of hate without love. D. The necessity of sound judgment and or discernment. And E. The failure to correctly assign motive and cause. Let us resume the discussion with C. Hate without love. Hate cannot exist or be understood without its opposite, love. Dr. Jack Hiles, who was a pastor for over 50 years, once said, quote, it is impossible to have true love without hate. One cannot love flowers without hating weeds. He cannot love health without hating disease. He cannot love God without hating Satan. He cannot love peace without hating war. The truth is, there is no quality without its opposite. There is no high without low, no hot without cold, no large without small, no tall without short, and no in without out. There is no merit in a plus without the potential of a minus. There is no true patience without the potential of impatience. There is no true good without the potential of bad. There is no courage without fear, no true gentleness without strength, no admirable kindness without the potential of temper, and certainly one cannot love if he does not hate its opposite and its enemy. Patience without potential impatience is laziness courage without potential fear is recklessness. Gentleness without potential strength is pacifism. Kindness without potential temper is weakness. 
A smile without a potential frown is unawareness. Love without hate is hypocrisy and is not love at all. The truth is that one loves as much as he hates. The more a mother loves her child, the more she hates the cancer that would take the child's life. The more a mechanic loves cars, the more he hates the rust that paralyzes them. The more a judge loves justice, the more he hates the crime. The more a doctor loves his patients, the more he hates the germs. The more a Christian loves God, the more he hates sin and the things that are anti-Christ. Unquote. From the above verses, it is clear that while God has the greatest capacity for love in that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place, he did so because he is holy and he hates sin and separation from his creation enough to motivate him to make such a sacrifice to reconcile us to himself. The entire purpose and exercise of our time on earth is designed to give time and opportunity for man to make one of two choices. Either we choose to acknowledge God as authority, repent of our rebellion against him, and accept his grace by faith in Jesus Christ, or we choose to fight and rebel against God and his ways while justifying our own. When we submit ourselves to God through repentance, we are immediately justified and reconciled to God by grace. We also begin a process where God sanctifies us and conforms us to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. While confirmation is a lifelong process, it is nonetheless a process which should progress day by day, moment by moment, as we surrender increasingly to God and less to ourselves. When we consider the accusation of hate against Christians from the world, typically these types of accusations come about whenever non-believers or secular Christians confront believers in the area of ideas which espouse those theological views found within the Bible. Since secular views flow from the spring of man's opinion, it comes as no surprise to discover that these views are usually polarized from those views found within God's word. If the average humanist legislated their own Ten Commandments, the first and foremost commandment would likely read, quote, Thou shalt be tolerant of all thy fellow man's feelings, beliefs, and behaviors, regardless of what they are, unquote. If Jesus were giving a politically correct version of the Beatitudes, he would assuredly have included, quote, Blessed it is he who proactively morally supports his fellow man in everything he and or she feels good about doing, unquote. Consequently, any person who vocalizes dissent or disagreement is labeled as being guilty of intolerance, hate, bigotry, prejudice, or extremist views. The motivation for using such pejorative terms is normally twofold. One, by accusing a person of hate, the person is automatically put on the defensive, since these terms carry such profoundly negative connotations taken out of context. Two, the emphasis of the argument in question is shifted from the merits of the facts in debate to the defense against the labels themselves. The next consideration is D. Hatred requires discernment and judgment. The proposition that hate requires a person to exercise discernment and judgment raises the second question posed in the episode, namely, quote, do or should Christians hate or judge, unquote. Or, as alternatively pointed out as an out-of-context axiom, quote, judge not that ye be not judged, unquote. But in truth, judgment and discernment are a prerequisite to pronouncing love or hate. Whether we adopt our source as being that of God or of man, whenever either side pronounces the presence of hate or love, judgment and discernment are required. Without the presence of judgment or discernment, there would be no way of making an analysis of whether hate or love is afoot. There is a problem for many in the secular humanist camp since the specter of judgment is as great a sin as that of hate in their world view. Frequently some will accuse Christians of being judgmental and go on to quote Jesus as saying, quote, Judge not, lest you be judged, unquote. This group goes on believing that they have blown up the Christian's position with their supposed hypocrisy and never stopping to realize that, one, by accusing Christians of judgment, they have done four things which in the face undermine the argument that they cite. 1. In order to accuse someone of being judgmental, 
the one accusing must first exercise judgment in order to discern whether or not someone else is being judgmental. Hence, the one accusing has exercised the dreaded judgment that they so disdain and is thus equally guilty of condemnation by their own standard. 2. By quoting the Bible, the one accusing has now stipulated to the Bible as authoritative and its contents as facts and evidence. 3. Because the one accusing has uh, quoted Jesus as the one who holds authority over judgment, they now stipulate to Jesus as being one in authority over all. Otherwise, they are simply picking and choosing randomly and have thus held themselves in authority. 4. When applying scripture, it is important to apply all scripture in context so as to avoid cherry-picking in an effort to support personal opinion. This begs the question, what is the biblical perspective on judgment in context? In this case, we start with Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 2. Quote, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye should be forgiven. Unquote. Reading in context, it becomes clear. Jesus wasn't saying, quote, don't judge, unquote. He was saying, quote, don't judge your brother without first judging yourself, unquote. People have a visceral reaction to judging because they believe judging implies condemnation. But this is not the case. Let us examine additional scriptures to help provide context to correctly understand the issue of judgment. For example, Luke chapter 7, verses 40 through 43, quote, And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to thee. And he saith, Master, speak. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence, the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said to him, Thou hast rightly judged. Unquote. In this passage, Jesus invited Simon to make a judgment, then commended him when he judged rightly. What we take away from this is that God wants us to make right or righteous judgments. Another example, John chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. Quote, Jesus answered and said to them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave to you circumcision, not because it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath receiveth circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have restored a man to sound health on the Sabbath? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment." Unquote. Here, in this verse, Jesus answered some of his critics who had judged his works according to the appearance, rather than according to righteous judgment. Another example can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1-4. through 4. Quote, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church." Unquote. Here again, judgment is established as necessary and good. More importantly, the judgments of the saints, i.e. those who abide in Christ, is set apart and above the judgment of the world, i.e. those outside or apart from Christ. Another example, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Quote, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord shall come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make known the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise from God. Unquote. In context, this verse does not say that we are to refrain from any kind of judgment until the Lord returns. Preceding verses reveal this fact. What it is emphasizing is that we are not supposed to judge that which is hidden presently, or that which we cannot discern right now, i.e. men's hearts. At this point, many will say, yes, that's right, you don't know what's in my heart or my mind, therefore your judgment is unbiblical and unjust. 
Well, that is true, just as it is true that one does not know what kind of a tree one is dealing with at a great distance. However, as we meet the tree, the tree will demonstrate its own nature. The leaves, the branches, and the fruit, or the lack thereof, give evidence as to the nature of the tree. Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, explain this concept. Quote, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them." Unquote. Again, this is repeated in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 and 44. Quote, For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Unquote. Thus, while the sap of the tree may remain hidden, the nature of the tree is made manifestly evident to all who look. The question is, then, with what eyes do we truly see and discern the tree? Is it God's indwelling spirit in our lives which quicken our spirit and brings to life that which was dead to sin and rebellion? When the believer is made alive in Jesus Christ, he and or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. We see and understand things according to his laws and ordinance written in our hearts. With a new birth, we receive discernment. As we yield to God's conviction, we first begin to recognize those aspects of sin and rebellion in our own lives which separate us from God's holiness. During the process of the new birth, the believer is justified by grace through faith in the all-sufficiency and merits of Christ's covering atonement by his death in our place. As the believer is buried with Christ by faith, they are resurrected with him by his power. God breathes his spirit into our lives. As we yield to his spirit, we are progressively sanctified by the same power which continues to regenerate our hearts and minds to the fullness of his likeness. Once having been born from above, we become his followers, i.e. Christians. As his followers, we are commanded to share the same good news which saved us. At times, this commandment includes sharing the truth that another person is lost, wandering, in sin, rebellion, and separation from God. We are to offer God's love through the same repentance and process which so thankfully affects us. The final consideration is motive and cause. From the study of scripture and our discussion so far, we learn that there exists a dynamic polarity between God God's way, God's spirit, and the believer who abides in Jesus Christ by the new birth, and that of the world, the flesh, sin, and Satan. The two sides cannot be reconciled or mediated. The two are constantly at war with one another. So when the issue of hate is raised, we need to understand that hate exists in every man's heart. The real question is whether the hate can be justified as righteous hatred or fleshly hatred. One type of hate flows from the flesh, sin, the world, and ultimately Satan. The other type flows from adopting the same mindset that God himself has towards sin and rebellion as we position ourselves in harmony with him by his spirit. The truth is, realistically speaking, any two or more persons are capable of having views and opinions which are diametrically opposed while maintaining respect for the individuals who hold them. The mere presence of dissent or disagreement with another or their position does not automatically equate to hate for the individual espousing the position. While it is true that all people are subject to the influence of sin, which would include hate, the sincere Christian who has been made a new creation through grace by faith in Jesus Christ is motivated primarily by love of his fellow man's spirit. It is because of love, not hate, that Christians are 